Well, the the, uh, the March of Death uh, was properly named because it certainly was a March of Death. I think something like 10,000 men perished, died during the March of Death. The, the, uh, the preponderance of those people were Filipinos. We probably lost about 1,000 men. The remaining number were Filipinos. Of course, there were around 60,000 Filipinos around the March of Death, and there were around about 15,000 of us. And during the March of Death, uh, I saw several atrocities. One that I'll never forget is when I saw a Japanese tank that was coming in the opposite direction that we were marching, and deliberately swerved from its course and ran over a young American, caught him under the tracks of his tank, and literally just crushed him right in the ground. His body became a part of the road. Another incident that I remember very, very vividly is a young Filipino scout had both of his legs amputated and the bandages on his legs that were remaining were still fresh with blood. And here this gentleman was on his stomach trying to make the march by pulling himself along the road just with the use of his arms. We arrived at Camp O'Donnell, which was one of the real terrible prison camps. And during the two months that I was incarcerated there, they buried 1,100 Americans and 14,000 Filipinos. In fact, death was a part of our life. They, uh, uh, they were burying 50 and 60 Americans every day. Every day, 50 or 60 Americans would be buried. And they didn't even have the decency of burying the men with any, uh, any ceremony whatsoever. They just throw their body into an into a open grave like it was a piece of cordwood. And they wouldn't even allow us to arrange the body in any orderly fashion. Uh, but that Camp O'Donnell was a, was a terrible prison camp. And then you went from there to? Then from there, I, uh, they moved me from Cabana de Juan, from Camp O'Donnell to Cabana de Juan. And here again, Cabana de Juan was a very terrible prison camp. Uh, again, they were burying 50 and 60 every day. And I was there for five months. And then they moved 2,000 of us to the island of Mindanao to the Davao Penal Colony. And uh, we were on board a ship for, I think, around 10 days. We arrived from the island of Luzon to the island of Mindanao to the Davao Penal Colony. Then on the 4th of April of 1943, there were 10 of us Americans and two Filipinos that escaped from the Filipino colony, and we joined the guerrilla forces, and I served with them until the 29th of September of 1943, and that's the time when the Bofin picked me up off the north, north, north central coast of Mindanao and brought me to Fremantle, Australia. And the commanding officer of the, of the guerrillas, I believe, was... Commander Willingham, Commander Willingham. Oh, you know, the guerrilla forces. Well, the guerrilla forces that we joined was the 10th, under the 10th military district, commanded by uh, Wendell Ferdy. Mm -hmm. And how did he or, or the, those in charge of the, the guerrilla activities learn of the Bolton or some submarine coming in? Well, at that time, they did have uh, transmitters, and they were able to transmit information to some agency in Australia. And uh, the message went out that there were 10 Americans would escape from the Davao Penal Colony, and they had very vital information concerning prisoners of war who were captured on Bataan and Crigador. And they, shortly thereafter, they, uh, they uh, sent a submarine out and picked up three of our escapees. One was Commander McCoy, Melvin H. McCoy, who was a Annapolis graduate, and uh, Steve Melanick, who was a West Point graduate and my squadron commander, Ed Dias, and they named Dias Air Force Base after him in Abilene, Texas. And then it was on the, uh, it was shortly after that is when the, the Bofin came in and picked me up. Can you tell some of the highlights of your around 10 days time on the Bofin as the Bofin moved from Mindanao to Fremont Harbor? Well, I'd say it was probably the most exciting experience of my whole lifetime. I can honestly say that that group of men who composed the crew of the Bofin were uh, the finest men that I ever met in my whole life. I, they were just beautiful people. The thing that really impressed me was the time when we sunk the first ship, the klaxon horn went off, and these men manned their battle stations. You, you could just see organization and, 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 and dedication. They, they knew what they were doing, and, and they did it. 
They sunk the ship off of, uh, between Borneo and Zamboango. I believe it was a combination troop transport and cargo ship. And then they got another ship in the Indian Ocean, which I believe was a, was a uh, communications vessel. Finally, we arrived in Fremantle, Australia. And they put me in a the hospital there. And um, I believe it was the second night that I was in the hospital, several of the crew of the Bowfin came up to see me. And that was a very, in fact, it brought tears to my eyes to think that here are men that have been out on patrol for two months and they would take time enough to come and see me in the hospital. I just, I'll never forget that. Everyone in Broadhead. Yes, I know Reed was there, <laughs> Bud Kanaki, and uh, I can't remember the names of all of them, but they did sign a piece of paper of which I believe I sent to the, uh, to the uh, Bofin Museum in, in Pearl Harbor. They have a copy of the list of people assigned that, that sheet of paper. Will you repeat again, just uh, when and how did you learn that Reed Lee was a woven crew member and that he was from your home area? Well, as I recall it, and Reed and I, I think Reed's memory is a little better than myself, but uh, after we sunk the second ship in the Indian Ocean, which we sunk with deck fire, we submerged. While we were submerged, I was in the forward torpedo room sleeping on a, um, a canvas cot. And I went up to Reed and said, well, where are you from, Reed? He said, well, I'm from Colville, Washington. I said, well, I'm from Spokane, Washington. My God. And then I believe that's when we got into a discussion. I learned that he was the first cousin of Ray Cantrell, who was a very close friend of mine in the Air National Guard, who later on became a captain with the Pan American Airlines. And, um, of course, after I got home, I, uh, it was quite, quite a few years later, I had the opportunity to come to call and looked up Reed, and uh, since that time, we've been pretty close, and we've kept in close contact with each other. Uh, no.